In the remaining time of the lecture today, I'd like uh, to move towards uh, the two other requirements that I mentioned on uh, the second, I think, slide. Uh, there I mentioned that code size efficiency and runtime efficiency are also important. With respect to code size efficiency, I'd like uh, to uh, mention, to stress the fact that for so-called systems on the chip, we don't only have to implement the processes there on, on a particular chip, but also uh, the code and possibly also the areas needed for data. So therefore, we try to reduce these areas that are needed for storing code and data. And many, many different techniques have been proposed for that purpose. There is a website that provides an overview over different techniques that were proposed in that context. Unfortunately, the website is not uh, updated during the last eight or so years. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, most of the techniques were uh, published uh, uh, earlier than during the last uh, eight years, so that uh, uh, this website is still very useful. So in this context, we might think about the different techniques that we can use for uh, reducing uh, the area which is needed for, uh, for chips. And one technique that we can use there is to use compression. Compression means that instead of using this very large area there for, for the code, uh, we can think of uh, adding a little uh, compressor there and a little decompressor so that uh, at runtime we only need the decompression. Uh, if we can design a very smart compression technique, then we can potentially reduce the area which is needed there for the code. One technique that's available is uh, a technique that uh, employs a second instruction set, and that's available, for example, for ARM processors. ARM processors initially provide a 32-bit instruction set, which uh, allows so-called predicated execution. That means uh, you can evaluate a, a certain predicate, and depending on the result of that evaluation, a certain instruction is either executed or not. And then you have a so-called major opcode and a minor opcode. You can address uh, 16 registers, and you have uh, a large uh, uh, domain available and a large set of values available uh, for denoting constants. Now, in order uh, to uh, reduce uh, the size which is needed for storing instructions, there is a second instruction set, which is uh, called the SUMP instruction set. And the second instruction set is a 16-bit instruction set, uh, where only some of the opcodes available and only some of the minor opcodes are available. And for most of the instructions, you can address only half of the registers, and also the possible value ranges for constants are restricted. And in this way, you can encode all of this into 16 bits. Now, if we were lucky, we would be able to replace every 32-bit instruction by one 16-bit instruction, which would mean that we would have a saving of 50%. Now, obviously, we cannot be that lucky because in many cases we need more registers, we need additional instructions. But anyhow, uh, it has been reported that a reduction to 65 to 70 percent of the original code size is feasible. And this uh, small instruction bit width is also very useful if we have a memory which has only a very small number of bits at its output. Uh, if we had only 8 or 16 bits available at the memory output, then for 32-bit instructions we would need two or four cycles. However, if we have these narrow instructions, we need less cycles for uh, these uh, very narrow memories. And it has also been reported that even in the case of large memories, we don't lose uh, so much performance. Uh, the same approach uh, is also used for other processes, so there are many processes for which you can have these two instruction sets. But this comes at a cost, this comes at the cost of uh, providing uh, this extension in the compiler, in the assembler, in the linker, etc. And you also have to think about when to use one instruction set and when to use the other instruction set. Now, in a similar direction, we have uh, so-called dictionary approaches. Uh, 
uh, in dictionary approaches, we are exploiting the fact that uh, uh, there may be many instances of the same instruction pattern in the program, and we try to store each instruction pattern only once. We do this in a so-called dictionary. And then instead of uh, storing these instructions again and again, we just provide a pointer to the corresponding entry there in the dictionary. And uh, we are hoping for the fact that we have only very few entries there in the dictionary. And therefore, for this pointer, we need a very small bit width. So that's what we call the essence of these so-called dictionary-based approaches, uh, where we avoid a repetition of the same instruction again and again in the instruction memory. So that's the concept of the dictionary approach. I'd like uh, to demonstrate this in a little more detail. Uh, in this slide, we see the dictionary. So that's where we store each instru instruction pattern only once. And then hopefully we only have very few entries there. We assume that uh, we only have C entries there. Which means that for uh, the pointer addressing that table, we only need a total of uh, B bits where uh, uh, B um, is uh, corresponding to the logarithm of the number of entries that we need there. Then of course the processor will uh, provide the next instruction address. And using that next instruction address, we have to find the correct place there in this dictionary. And for this, we still need a table that provides a pointer uh, for this address uh, of this uh, place there in, in this dictionary. So, But this uh, table only has a very small bit width. Might have many entries. If we try to compare the number of bits that we uh, need in this case, we come up with the following um, uh, comparison. For the first table, we have uh, A entries, and uh, each entry is B bits wide. And for the second table, we have C entries, and each entry is D bits wide, where D is the original bit width of the instructions. And we are hoping for the fact that uh, B and or accordingly also C are rather small. And we are hoping for the fact that this is a lot smaller than what we had to store if we were not using uh, these uh, two different tables. If we would be storing everything in just one memory, we would be having A entries here, and each entry would be D bits wide, and we are hoping for the fact that the sum is smaller uh, than this expression. Yeah? This uh, can be achieved if we only have a very small uh, set of different patterns, like add registers 2 and 3, and the result will be placed in register 3. Uh, so if uh, that is happening rather frequently, we would be storing that pattern only once. Yeah? Uh, this kind of trick has been used in many cases. For example, it has been used in implementing microprogramming in one of uh, the, the first 16-bit uh, microprocessors. OK, that was uh, what I wanted to tell you about for this uh, second requirement. And now we are looking at the third requirement, which is uh, runtime efficiency. Runtime efficiency means that we would like uh, to make the most out of every cycle of our processor. So we would like uh, to use the processor cycles as efficiently as possible. And I'd like to demonstrate this uh, for uh, digital filtering where I'd like to use uh, each cycle uh, in, in, in the best way that's feasible. Uh, digital filtering uh, is a step which can be included in our processing pipeline uh, in a certain position. So this is the pipeline that we're using for digital signal processing. First of all, we will in general require anti-aliasing to avoid this aliasing that was uh, discussed in the last lecture. Then we have the sample and hold circuits, we have analog to digital conversion, and we have the processing. Now, for the processing, we have as input a particular signal, we call it W, and as a result, we will be getting a new signal, which we call X. And one of the very frequent operations that we find there for digital signal processors is that uh, this output signal should be 
a kind of weighted average over the last n values of the input sequence. So that means for each of the values from the input signal, we will be applying a certain weight, and uh, overall we would be having a weighted average over the last n values of the input se uh, sequence. Yeah? And by selecting these uh, weights, we can have certain uh, effects for, for our signal. We can uh, increase, uh, le let, let's say, uh, uh, the base tones. We can increase uh, high tones, whatever. It really depends on how we select uh, these values here. So just to be sure, uh, by using a particular index, I'm, uh, I'm referring to a particular instance in time. XS corresponds to the value of that signal at time TS. Yeah? Okay. Okay, next I'd like uh, to demonstrate how we are uh, using uh, processors that are optimized for this application to really perform this filtering very efficiently. And I've put there this equation again, and I will demonstrate how we will map that equation to digital signal processors, uh, assuming that initially we are summing up to a particular index value of k, and then iteratively we will be increasing the k uh, to finally do the computation until uh, k equals n minus 1. So we do this in the following way. We are using a loop here. We are using a loop which is running over k, initially from k equals 0, finally to k equals n minus 1, so that we are finally uh, really obtaining uh, the overall sum there. And in each iteration of the loop, we are doing the following. We are fetching the next two arguments from these two arrays, w and n a. Uh, we are uh, performing these operations there on these two arguments, which means that we are multiplying them and, and adding them to the partial sum that we have computed so far. And at the same time, we are adjusting the pointer so that for the next iteration, we will be accessing the next values there in the array. And when we do this until the very end, uh, finally, uh, in uh, this uh, uh, position uh, x of s, we will have the overall sum. Now this is done in a kind of pipeline manner and we also have to look at how we are setting up this pipeline. Initially, we are uh, initializing the partial sum to zero. We are loading the very first components that we are fetching from these two arrays into our argument registers. And we are initializing our argument pointers so that initially they are pointing to the second entry in these arrays. Yeah, the very first entries are already stored there in the arguments, and these pointers are pointing to the second entries that we would like to use so that in the first iteration of this loop we would be fetching the second entry from these arrays. So in this way we can perform these computations rather efficiently. And the structure is designed in such a way that we have uh, hardware components that allow us to implement this computation very efficiently. So we have this register in which we store the partial sums. We have the adder in which we perform these additions over here. And we have a multiplier that does these multiplications. And we have these argument registers in which we are always keeping the next arguments. And we have two separate memories so wet that we can fetch these two values concurrently at the same time so that in a single cycle we can fetch components from both arrays. And furthermore, we have address registers so that we can perform uh, these uh, adjustments of the address registers concurrently uh, with the other computations. Okay. So in that way, uh, this uh, structure is really optimized in such a way uh, that uh, what I have written down in these curly braces can be performed in a single cycle. Yeah, that's very important. All these operations that are included in the curly braces are performed in the same cycle. Now this means that what I put here in this kind of yellow box are these operations that are performed in a single cycle. Uh, 
And what we do there is called the multiply accumulate or MAC instruction. Yeah? But if you think about this carefully, you come to the conclusion that it would be really boring if we would execute all these operations in a single cycle and then for checking whether or not we have reached the end of the loop, we would be using additional cycles. That would be really boring. So therefore, designers have implemented a so-called zero overhead loop mechanism uh, where concurrently with performing the other operations, we can also check whether or not we have reached the end of the loop. Uh, this works as follows. Typically, we have a so-called uh, 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 prefix instruction or instruction prefix so that uh, ahead of executing the MAC instruction, we are executing the zero overhead loop instruction. And the zero overhead loop instruction has as a parameter the number of times that we would like to execute the zero overhead loop instruction. And uh, the checking whether or not we have reached the end of the loop is then done concurrently uh, with the operations of the MAC instruction. So that everything is done in a single cycle. So that means uh, if for the time being we ignore the setup of this pipeline, we need uh, n cycles for performing uh, these n iterations of the loop. Yeah, so this is, I think, the fastest that we can hope for. Yeah? Okay, so um, this also um, stresses uh, additional properties that we observe for these processes that are optimized for digital signal processing. And we have seen characteristics of digital signal processing already in the example. Uh, for digital signal processes, we have heterogeneous registers, which means that not, not all registers are of the same functionality. We have seen that already in this example. We saw that, for example, this register has a functionality which is different from the functionality of that one. Also, uh, we have observed that uh, there are, as a characteristic of digital signal processors, so-called separate address generation units. This means that uh, we have a special unit that is uh, connected to the address input of our memory. And whenever an address is already available there in the registers of that address generation unit, we can perform the addressing of the memory in parallel to the other operations and we don't need an extra cycle there. So that means we can fetch values from the data memory uh, from any address which is contained in that address register in parallel to the other operations and this means that this can be done effectively in zero time. We only need to take into account the time that we're needing there in the main data path. In order to increase the number of values that are available there in the register file, uh, we have uh, added a little adder there uh, which can add and subtract values that are contained there in the address register file concurrently with the operation in the main data path. And if we want to have more values that can be generated in parallel, we also can add a so-called modify register file, which typically would contain values such as uh, 2, 4, or 8. That means the lengths of the different uh, data objects in bytes so that we can uh, correct these addresses to fetch the next byte. If we would be fetching an arbitrary uh, um, from an arbitrary address there, uh, we would be needing additional so-called immediate instructions, which would need additional cycles. And uh, one goal in uh, the chapter of opt on optimization will be uh, the goal to minimize the number of immediate instructions. And that will be covered in the chapter on optimizations. Another property that we find for these uh, DSP processes is a property which allows us uh, to address uh, the values there in uh, the memories. Because there has been one case in which I actually oversimplified the situation. Just look at this uh, particular addressing that we're using there. Uh, in this case, uh, we are storing values in some vector. And S is an index which is increasing all the time. 
And we would like to design filters which run all the time. So whenever we turn on our MP3 player, we expect that MP3 player to play as long as uh, there, there is some power available. So therefore, uh, if it would actually be implemented in this way, we would be increasing S all the time, and that means uh, that uh, X needs to be an infinitely large array, which of course doesn't work. Yeah? So, but there is a way around it, because we can exploit the fact that uh, we don't need all these values at the same time, but we only need a window of length n. And uh, therefore, we can use a cyclic buffer, and we can store all the previous values in the cyclic buffer, and we can also store the future values in the cyclic buffer. That means in the memory, we are implementing a cyclic buffer. And in the cyclic buffer, somewhere we have the most recent entry, and somewhere we have the oldest entry. And whenever we switch from the consideration of one particular window into our signal, towards the next window into our signal, we will be replacing the oldest entry there in our cyclic buffer by the most recent value there in the cyclic buffer. And in this way, we only uh, need uh, n different locations there in, in our array. Uh, we don't need an array that has an infinite size. Yeah? In order for this to work, we have to introduce so-called modulo addressing, which means that all these uh, operations on uh, these uh, address registers need to be taken modulo uh, the size of that buffer, yeah? which is uh, a very good reason for adding that addressing mode uh, to the capabilities of DSP processes. Now there's uh, another feature uh, that we would like uh, to have for uh, processors, and that is uh, saturating arithmetic. In standard arithmetic, whenever we have an overflow, we just uh, discard the carry, and this means that if uh, we add this number, which I consider to be a seven in this case, and if we add a nine, we would have a carry, and the carry would be discarded, and a standard arithmetic would just return a zero there, uh, which of course is not very nice. In saturating arithmetic, in the case of an overflow, we return the largest possible number, and in the case of an underflow, we return the smallest possible number, which means that in this case, we would be returning uh, the largest possible number there, uh, which would be uh, 15. Uh, the overall goal could be to compute the average of the two numbers. Uh, we can divide by two by shifting these uh, bit uh, strings uh, one position to the right, if we would do this for the standard arithmetic, the result would be zero. If we do this uh, for uh, our arithmetic, if we would shift that uh, by one position to the right, uh, we would be getting this result, which is a seven, which is not really the true eight, but it's not too far away, it's not too far off from, from the real result. And there are many cases in which this is much more appropriate than generating an error message. If uh, we are uh, using uh, our processors for DSP and multimedia applications, uh, then we wouldn't really have the time to generate exceptions. So it doesn't really help me if on my uh, MP3 players I have a message integer overflow. Uh, it, it, it's not very useful if I listen to music. It's much more useful if we just restrict the values to the maximum values that can be represented. So uh, I think from these examples, it's pretty obvious that precise values are not really that important. And it's pretty obvious that wraparound would not be uh, an advantage there. I'd like to demonstrate that using a, a small audio example.
So I'm, I'm using a speech sample, which is in German, because that was one that uh, we had uh, uh, access to without violating an, any uh, license constraints. And now I'm going to play uh, that little speech example. It's in German, but I, I mean the content of the speech doesn't really matter um, in this context. Uh, and I'm going to play this little uh, sample, first of all using um, uh, this uh, standard wraparound arithmetic where you will hear that uh, there, there is a lot of distortion. Mit meinem Geburtsnamen und dem Namen meiner damals unverheirateten Mutter verband mich, als ich nach Deutschland zurückkehrte, wenig mehr als die Erinnerung an eine nicht ganz leichte Kindheit. Das mag vielen ungewöhnlich erscheinen und ist es wohl auch. Aber es hat nie das Recht, meine Ehre streitig. Okay, I think that was uh, sufficiently poor. So now we are trying the saturating arithmetic. There will still be some distortion, but uh, I think you will hear the difference. Ich habe nichts zu verbergen mit meinem Geburtsnamen und dem Namen meiner damals unverheirateten Mutter verband mich, als ich nach Deutschland zurückkehrte, wenig mehr als die Erinnerung an eine nicht ganz leichte Kindheit. Das mag vielen ungewöhnlich erscheinen und ist es wohl auch. Aber es hat niemand das Recht, mir meine Ehre streitig zu machen. I think it was pretty obvious that uh Saturating arithmetic was superior to uh, wraparound arithmetic. Okay, some more properties of uh, processors that uh, uh, try to exploit uh, uh, the available processor cycles. Uh, one of these properties is uh, the use of fixed-point arithmetic, which means that in contrast to the standard integer arithmetic, we are no longer constrained to uh, assume that the binary point is uh, at, at the very right end of uh, the binary digits, but it can be anywhere in between. Uh, uh, this requires that there is uh, some support for fixed point arithmetic in, in the processor, for example, for multiplications. We have to make sure that we maintain the intended number of uh, uh, binary digits uh, right to the right of the uh, binary point there. Uh, in many cases, in uh, embedded applications, we have a pretty good knowledge about the range of values that can be observed. And in many cases, uh, uh, energy-efficient processors do not provide floating-point arithmetic, so therefore the use of uh, fixed-point arithmetic can help there. However, we have to be very careful when we design a system using uh, fixed-point arithmetic because we have to try to avoid any overflows. Also in this context, uh, we have to consider a real-time capability, which is another a characteristic of uh, uh, the processes that we are using in this case. Uh, this real-time capability is especially important if we think about the interface to the physical environment. That means if we think about real cyber physical systems. Uh, there we have to uh, achieve timing predictability and unfortunately many processes are designed so that they show a certain uh, performing performance only on the average and therefore it could happen that we violate uh, time constraints. There are a couple of features that are used in standard processes which make timing behavior not very well predictable and these include uh, caches was difficult to predict the uh, replacement strategies, so-called unified caches, which means that instructions and data are stored in uh, the same cache and they could uh, evict each other. Uh, there could be pipelines with uh, difficult to predict the stall cycles, so-called uh, bubbles, uh, 
which also make it very difficult to predict the timing. Uh, communication sometimes uh, depends really uh, on the interference between different communication partners. Again, that would be a source of unpredictability. And then we have more sources of timing unpredictability like a branch prediction, a speculative execution, interrupts that can happen anytime, memory refreshes that can happen anytime. And we could have instructions that have data dependent execution times. All uh, these are possible sources of timing unpredictability. And uh, if we have to design a cyber physical system, it may be important to avoid as many of these as possible. Then we have already seen that uh, in certain cases, multiple memory banks are very useful. We saw uh, that for the uh, DSP processor that I introduced. Uh, there we were taking advantage of the fact that we can fetch uh, two values there from the two memories at the same time uh, so that we are loading uh, two data registers at the same time. Then another feature which is frequently exploited for these uh, processors is uh, the use of uh, multiple uh, operations that can be performed on values that are stored in, in the same registers. We can exploit the fact that uh, in multimedia we in many cases have rather narrow data types like we have only 8-bit values for a particular color. We might have only 16-bit for a, a particular channel in, in audio. And on the other hand, we observe that uh, the bit width of uh, uh, registers is becoming wider and wider. We have seen the uh, transition towards uh, 64 bits. And in some cases, we might even have uh, 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 registers that are 128 bits wide. So that means uh, many of these uh, data values can be stored in the same register. And if we would be performing arithmetic operations on these uh, long registers, we can be performing operations on many of uh, these data items at the same time. So for example, if we would be storing, that's a very easy case, uh, two 16-bit audio samples in one two 32-bit registers, then we can perform on these two data values at the same time. The only thing that we have to make sure is that we have uh, no overflow, no carry uh, propagating from one half of the register into the other half of the register, but that is rather trivial because we just have to suppress the carry. Uh, which, uh, uh, as a circuit, uh, is, is, is very easy to implement. Uh, this is exploited rather frequently because it is about the cheapest way of adding parallelism to a design because the designer can still think uh, sequentially. There is not a lot of overhead in, in, in the circuit and it's actually a way of avoiding the, the uh, trend towards uh, multiprocessors as long as possible. So if without this feature uh, we have reached uh, the performance limit, we can try to exploit that feature and still uh, stick to single thread execution where the transition towards multi-threaded execution uh, would be uh, resulting in a lot of additional programming effort. So therefore, this approach is rather popular and it has been implemented in the so-called streaming extensions for standard microprocessors and in some cases this is also called uh, the case of uh, uh, SIMD instructions which stands for single instruction multiple data. That means on one instruction uh, we uh, have, uh, an for one instruction we have an impact on multiple uh, data. So this leads to the summary for today. Uh, you might remember that uh, in the last lecture I started to talk about hardware in the loop and uh, we talked about census and discretization and now today I started to talk about information processing. I stressed the importance of energy efficiency. Uh, I pointed to the fact that uh, designing special purpose hardware is very expensive so therefore we are not covering this in this course. And I then uh, pointed towards various issues in the context of energy efficiency. Uh, there were some uh, statistics which uh, provided some information on where the energy is actually burned. And we also looked at uh, some uh, examples of uh, optimization techniques here. More optimization techniques will actually be covered on in the chapter on optimizations.
And then I briefly looked at the techniques for uh, improving the code size efficiency and we also looked at techniques for improving the runtime efficiency. This means we are trying to get the most out of every uh, processor cycle. So this uh, conclude, concludes today's lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs>